much. While I'm trying to load my presentation, um, I ju just want to say thank you for inv inviting me here. Uh, this is my um, second time uh, having the chance to speak in front of this uh, distinguished audience. Uh, and um, I really appreciate and enjoy the experience. Um, I also enjoy coming to Georgia. This is my, if I'm not wrong, sixth or eighth time the last two years. And I enjoy not only coming to this beautiful country, but also meeting customers, partners, uh, putting our sleeves up and working both in the operational and strategical envisions that uh, you have how you want to move forward um, the country. Okay. So my team told me to look for number nine, right? Okay, uh, so we are ready to go. Last year, uh, one of the topics that uh, I presented and we discussed afterwards was about how you make a country competitive. And that was based on the Global Competitiveness Index. This is the report that the World Economic Forum is uh, um, reporting or issuing every year. So uh, there is a progress with Georgia. During last re report, 2014-2015, Georgia as a country was on, uh, ranked as uh, 69. Uh, within the new report, Georgia is ranked uh, 66. So there are three, three steps going up. Congratulations for this. But as people say, we also have to look at the details. And, um, the report is publicly available, so you can uh, have a look at it, because it is not only going up in the ranks, uh, if you remember, but it's also moving from the efficiency group to the group of innovators, uh, the countries that are really putting innovation as a priority, how they want to drive their competitiveness. Today, I want to build upon on, on this and speak about digital government and how empowering these governments they are transforming not only themselves, but also they're transforming the countries and making the country more uh, competitive. So what we see as uh, um, in, in the world, so governments are not uh, living their own life, they're not living in, in, in a separate silo. Governments are the people. People are electing governments. So governments' core priorities are how they should sustain or how they should ensure economic growth, how they will ensure social inclusion, environmental sustainability, and uh, last but not least, good governance. And below all these four areas, when you go into the details, there are more and more KPIs that governments need to, to focus in order to deliver to the citizens. On the other side, the drivers and challenges. We have urbanization. Just think about Georgia, how many people are coming to, to live in the cities? How many people are starting to look for jobs from their small villages to the big cities? We have health and safety, another challenge that governments need to ensure. Um, natural resources. Not every country is rich on natural, uh, natural resources. So empowerment, connected agencies, or how we can attract the citizens to be part of the whole government process. Uh, aging infrastructure. So how, what is the amount of investments every government needs to uh, do every year in order to sus not, sus not improve, just sustain electricity, water management, um, and all this type of infrastructure that people are used to live and they are expecting better services. Of course, responsible spending. Governments are managing our money as taxpayers. So we pay taxes and governments are responsible to manage these taxes in the best way for us as citizens. And uh, 
Last year we also spoke about the big trends, social, cloud, big data, security, um, and uh, mobility. Now, as things evolve, we, we evolve as, as personalities, organizations evolve, and the technology is driving, the technology is kind of a catalyst for all this evolution and change. This year I want to mention something else, but before going there, um, I would like to recommend you to read a book. The book is called, is named The Most Powerful Idea of the World. It's, uh, the author is a UK writer. And it is very interesting because it defines how technology is changing the world. It outlines why a locomotive, you know, locomotive that was pulling train, uh, that is now on exhibition in the London Museum, it's called the rocket. This is the name of the locomotive. So why this locomotive is the symbol of the industry revolution in the 19, 18th and 19th century. So very, very interesting book. And it's not about the locomotive, but how the threats over time, the previous centuries, uh, were helping, or how to say, were moving into this building, this locomotive, starting from the steam power, going to competition legislation. Uh, do you know that two, two or three centuries ago, the Queen of, of England was having a monopoly of one company to produce playing cards. So one company in England was producing playing cards for the Queen. And there was a challenge which was regulated by a court that another company wanted to produce the same cards. So this court decision, two or three centuries ago, actually opened up the competition that we are witnessing at the moment. The openness, how the innovation drives, uh, how competition drives innovation. So, going back about technology as a catalyst for innovation. So government now needs to reset their operations in order to meet the demands of the citizens. We as citizens are used to uh, work with banks, retailers, and any other private organization 24 by 7, not going to the offices, using internet, digital signatures, or any other technology uh, that we think we are comfortable with in order to be serviced out of these organizations. This is the same expectations that we want governments to provide the same level of service. Not only the same level, but in a very secured uh, way, so that all our data, everything that we interact with government organizations are uh, sec secure. So from that perspective, what we see is that the evolution of these four trends, mobility, cloud, big data, security, and social, now brings something else. We now speak about analytics. We speak, speak about machine learning. And some of this you will see later uh, during my presentation and the presentations of uh, my colleagues. Collaboration and productivity. This is another thing that is deriving from the, for, uh, from the big uh, technology trends. How are we positioned as Microsoft? Uh, we believe that we as Microsoft and our local partners in the countries, we provide the scale. So there are many solutions, products and services that governments are using in order to uh, change and to evolve as organizations. Speed, by our intelligent cloud, governments can go up and down on the level of services, the type of services that they provide. Uh, openness, 24 by 7. Uh, trust, but we'll speak about trust a little bit later. So we as Microsoft, we also evolve as an organization. And uh, our difference is that we are customer or citizen centric. We look, we try to look through the eyes of governments in order to understand what citizens are expecting. We look through the eyes of the citizens through the eyes of banks that are our customers and try to analyze the expectations and uh, the different level of sophistication the uh, services need to be built upon. We built our own partner ecosystem. We are not going directly. We invest in the country, and this morning David Asatiani mentioned that in Georgia, through different programs, we invested $50 million in education. 
We do the same with partners. We find partners, we grow them, we educate them, we train them. We have our trusted cloud, but for trust we'll speak a little bit later. And openness. How many of you uh, read uh, the announcement we did on November 4th that we are going into a partnership agreement with Red Hat? Do you believe that two or three years ago people will be saying Microsoft and Linux? You're crazy. Now Red Hat and customers of Red Hat can use our Asia platform to uh, run their uh, systems and applications. So we are also changing our mission and strategy. Last year we announced that our mission as a company is to empower every individual and organization on the planet to achieve more. What it means as a strategy, we want to build the best platform and the best productivity services in the mobile first cloud first world. That <coughs> outlines investment in three areas. Investment in productivity and new business processes, investment into building intelligent cloud, and also uh, creating more personal computing. Imagine uh, how, how these three areas are impacting you as uh, civil servants, you as citizens, you as employees of uh, different organizations. When we, sp when we speak about digital governments, we we'll look at four areas. The first one is efficient government operations. How you optimize the operations that you run as a government organization. How you are building a flexible, trusted infrastructure uh, that, and solutions that uh, you can run your operations on. The second area is smarter government actions. I mentioned about the taxes. How you optimize the spending. How you take decisions based on a fact driven. How you make your policies using the different facts and the different data that you are receiving. Modernizing government mobility. Think about a tax inspector or a police on the road. So these people need to be connected to their organizations. They need to be able to work and perform and be productive the, way, the same way as if they're sitting in a, in a physical office uh, somewhere in a similar nice building. And last but not least is connecting, connecting agencies. Not only connecting agencies by, among themselves, but also including citizens, how citizens can be part of this connectivity. And, and further on, I will, I will focus only on two out of these areas, the uh, connecting agencies and also the smarter government actions. But before moving to, uh, to this, I want to mention something about trust. You don't use a technology or a service if you don't trust it, right? So nobody can force you to do something if you are not uh, physically persuaded, mentally persuaded that this is a trusted environment that you can operate. So Microsoft is putting a lot, a lot of efforts, investments into building a trustworthy computing for our customers and our partners. Oh, sorry. There should have been a picture of our CEO. I'm sorry about that. Something happened with the deck. Anyway, two days ago, Satya Nadella delivered a keynote speech in front of the Cloud Government Forum in Washington. And he made several announcements. The first one is that we are changing the approach how we treat security. It's about protect, detect, and respond. The second thing is that he announced that we are investing $1 billion per year in making our products and services secure. Um, our technology, the solutions that partners are building using our technology. So $1 billion per year. The other announcement was that we are opening a cyber defense operational center. This is a high, a state of the art, highly sophisticated facility that will run 24 by 7, will have access and will connect thousands of engineers, security experts all around the world in order to make data analysis, in order to make threat analysis, to be able to uh, build a rapid response to anything that is coming out in the cyber, cyber world. And the other announcement is that we are building a Microsoft Enterprise Cyber Security Group that will work with customers to analyze to uh, guide and also to build cybersecurity strategies for our uh, enterprise customers. 
One thing I also want to mention is uh, around uh, the security is that we are hardware agnostic. I'm using Android phone, so I'm allowed to use Android phone, but my authentication runs on the cloud. So it doesn't matter if the device is Android, iOS, or Windows phone. Uh, on the tablet, I'm using Windows 10, and I have biometrical authentication, so nobody can see my uh, uh, password typing it. It's my iris of the eyes. So these are just examples what we do in order to protect our customers and our partners from a endpoint protection. We will do the same on the server side, but this, uh, this is an area that we'll be happy to discuss with you on some other um, occasions. So, moving to the four areas, connecting agencies and citizens. Um, as we saw in some of the previous uh, presentation, citizens' data reside in different organizations. Unless we, may, we connect them to start talking together, the citizens will be exposed to going from one organization to another, switching from one website to another website, or doing, trying to do a service or to get a service, not only when they want, but from nine to five. And this is extremely important, and we are trying to build all the necessary solutions and services to make, to facilitate this collaboration uh, between among agencies and uh, citizens. Think about your kids. My son is 18 years old. He's using his devices, and I'm honest with, with you, he has a Windows tablet, an, a MacBook Pro, and an uh, iPhone. So he's using these devices, Office 365, as a platform for collaboration and uh, communication in their schools. They're doing homeworks, they communicate with teachers, they uh, do a lot of their researches uh, in the internet uh, as a collaboration. They build their teams together, virtually and they use these virtual teams in order to prepare their projects for uh, whatever the, the, the teachers are asking them. So this model of work he will transfer when he becomes an employee or when he starts running his own business and he will expect from his employees to, to have the same type of collaboration. So these millennials, as, as we call them, this is the new labor force. And we have to be pre prepared, both as businesses and governments, to provide the same model of work these people are used to in order to get the highest level of productivity from them. So the other thing is, as you can see here, eight billion dollars will be the savings annually if uh, the businesses are implementing video conferences rather than uh, flying around or going on business trips and making physical, physical meetings. Again, what are the, the challenges that I mentioned? So we have citizens and civil servants working anywhere, anytime. They need to have the better tools, they need to have access to the information and the data they need at the moment, not tomorrow, not in one hour, not next week, now. The second thing is that, and you know it by, by yourself, every country is reducing their state budgets. So they need to optimize. So how they optimize it? They spend in electricity, they spend in productivity, they spend in collaboration. So, the technology that we are providing both with our partner ecosystem is helping them to overcome these challenges. Better coordina coordination and connection among agencies and departments. Um, leaders, government leaders, they have a totally different set of priorities. They need to take decisions based on data. They need to make policies based on data. So they need to have access to this data. They have to collaborate among themselves as political and government leaders in order to provide the appropriate and the correct policies and legislations. And last but not least, protecting individual data. So how you are securing the personal data, how you are securing the transactions. So all these challenges are in the minds of the, both Microsoft and our partners and our customers. Let's go and look the profiles. We have government leader, we have employee, 
uh, government employee and field work. All these, tribe, these high level uh, roles require different level of collaboration, different, different level of productivity and different le level of data access. So we have a, a leader that is his work or her work is so important because whatever they do now, whatever decisions they take will have an impact in the next three to five, even ten years. Government employees, these are the people that we are in interacting every day as citizens. If they are not productive, if they are not able to collaborate among themselves, everything will be on us as citizens. We will not receive the appropriate service, we will fail, our dissatisfaction will be very, very high. Of course, when voting comes, elections come, we would like to change the leaders. And last but not least, field, field workers. Uh, utilities or police cars or customs officers. So customs, are, it is not only the physical border now, but customs are, uh, operations are going across uh, each and every country. It's not only border, but it go in the country, outside the country, depending on uh, the different uh, roles. So these are, this is another view of how we want and how we are working with government to, to have an end-to-end -end productivity from their side. So business intelligence, enterprise social. So how we are using these trends that we, uh, we spoke last year in order to make a government transform and reset their operations and become really digital. Field, mobility, control and compliance, not only internally, but also with international standards. And of course, how we reduce cost by uh, using technology. One example, State of European Union conference, 400 attendees joined over Skype for Business. Imagine from six countries, how much money will be spent if these 400 people will be traveling to one location? What will be the carbon dioxide emission by these people traveling? Or what will be the, the cost per diems, hotels, etc., etc. So this is just one simple example how technology can uh, really bring uh, transformation into government operations. The second area I, I, I promised you about is about smart government actions or how they use the data in order to take the right decisions and to build the right policies. What are the challenges? It makes no sense me to tell you. So you yourself know the amount of data you generate. So some people are taking photos, this uh, date, uh, data. Some people are making phone calls, SMSs, electronic signature. These are all processes that generate data. So these data are unstructured, they're complex, they're re residing in different locations. Um, security, privacy, and regulatory requirements. Another challenge for data management. Um, as I said, they reside in different platforms. And also constant changes in policies and uh, citizens' requests. No matter of this. Governments need to provide the economic growth, social inclusion, environmental sustainability, and good governance. These are the priorities of the governments. We elected our government elite in order to uh, make this happen. We don't care about how governments will be taking care about the data, how they will take decisions. And here Microsoft comes with our partner ecosystem to help this transition from this vast amount of data and how governments can really benefit from this. Some examples, social network awareness, how you connect unemployment with jobs, how you sense the sentiment of the people that you manage or you, you govern as a government, uh, event prepa preparation and response. I'll give you one example there. I don't know if you remember, but two years ago there was a big, big hurricane in New hurricane uh, that hit New York, or eastern coast of US, a lot of damages. New York police, together with Microsoft, built the so-called do domain awareness system. One of the features that they are using is to predict if there is a hurricane, what will be the level of the ocean going up. Two, two years ago, or three years ago, when the hurricane hit New York, they lost a lot of police cars because they parked them at the pressings, but then the water came, this was lost. 
Now they're using this domain awareness system to predict where they have to park the cars in order to keep them safe from any natural disaster. Fraud detection. Just imagine about tax. So tax is the core or how to say the main cash flow for governments. It, it outlines the social responsibility of the government, health, education, logistic, pandemic, so transportation optimization. Again, this is something that, uh, that is on the top of the agenda of every mayor, every government, every minister. And so, and so, and so. Skip that one. I'm going to two examples. Tax and revenue uh, is the first one. And we as Microsoft and our partners, based on our worldwide experience working with tax offices, we define the framework into three areas. Service delivery, tax processing, analytics and insight. I'm not going into details because uh, um, these are data that uh, uh, we can provide uh, you. First examples, tax office in Mexico. 45 million taxpayers in Mexico. What they said, they wanted to reduce by 15% the, the tax evasion. They want to improve the image of the agency as a tax. This is natural. I don't like to pay taxes and uh, I need to have a, a, a better, uh, okay, a, a better partner. So they built a, a, a model, a hybrid cloud. They're using Azure as a platform where they're sending data, anonymous data. They're processing that te te text declaration. Next uh, example when I'm finished. So once upon a time in London. So in 1854, London was hit by a cholera epidemic. And there was one uh, physicist, uh, John Snow, who was saying that cholera is transported not over air, air, but through water. So when the epidemic erupted, he started to map about the cases on the map of London. So he also, uh, it's not visible, he also outlined where the water pumps people are using were situated. So he saw that on Broad Street pump, that was the most concentrated cholera cases. However, there were two noisy data. One was the brewery, which was part in the core of the cholera epidemic, and the other one was the, area, the other area of London. Then another guy, Reverend Henry Whitehead, came into the picture and he told uh, Dr. Snow the following. The people from this smaller circle down were bringing their children to school and they were pouring water from the Broad Street pump. So contamination happened. And the second thing is the brewery anomaly, where there was not a single case of cholera. People were not drinking water, they were drinking beer. So additional analysis showed that really cholera was transformed by, was transitioned by water, and they found out that there was a big sewage uh, that was contaminating the water at Broad Street Pump. Several centuries later, or 21st centuries now, we speak about the same challenges in health using data. And I want to, to bring an, a very short example that we are doing with the Health Insurance Fund of Croatia. We are applying Azure machine learning in order to make fraud, to detect automatically fraud and to take the necessary measures. Uh, my colleague will go into more deep details later today, but this is one of the examples how you can see two hospitals were caught, or how to say, identified as the biggest uh, organizations that are uh, uh, misusing the processes in the health insurance fund. I'm finishing with a joke. So the street light effect. You know the joke that a drunk a policeman was walking down the street and then he was looking, uh, a, a drunken man was going around uh, a street light in a circle looking for something. And he asked him, what, what are you looking for? I lost my keys. So the police started to go around and they didn't find anything. So, um, why did you lose my, your keys? Well, I lost them in the park, but why are you looking here? Because there is a light. Thank you very much.